Habakkuk chapter 2. You can go there or you can wait right where you're at and I'll read it to you. Okay? And it says this, the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 and in verse number... Let's see. You know what? I want to... I think I want to have... You know, I'm going to start in verse number... Uh, Two. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. That's the part I want to focus in on. The just shall live by his faith. Now, this is quoted three times in the New Testament. So, you have this, this reference, uh, and this, this is, a, this is a, a truth that I, I want to zero in on. You have this for a total of four times. This is said four times that just shall live by his faith. You got Habakkuk 2, 4. And then it's referenced and quoted in Romans 1, Galatians 3, Hebrews 10. Romans 1, 17, Galatians 3, 11, and Hebrews 10, 38. Okay, the just shall live by his faith. So the logical next question is, well, who are the just? Who are the just? Well, I'm glad you asked. Continuing on with the new pulpit Bible, Romans chapter 5. Now, you understand I'm taking a risk because everything is highlighted in the other one with notes. This is fresh and clean. It's a new slate. But wait a minute. It's fresh and clean. It's a new slate for you today. How about that? Romans chapter 5, and I'll read this to you. Now hang right on in there because this is some good stuff you're going to get today, okay? The just shall live by his faith. Well, who are the just? Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And let me back up to chapter 3, simply because I put that in my notes. Chapter 3... <clears throat> Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. And in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, who are the just? Those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who have received forgiveness. Those who have had their sins washed. Those who have taken their place in Christ. Those who trust in him for salvation, we are the just. We are the just. So he's speaking to us when he says the just shall live by his faith. He's not talking to the heathen or to sinners, is he? Because they're not born again yet. They haven't received Jesus Christ yet. And so it would not be right to tell a sinner, hey, the just, you got to live by faith, bud. I don't even understand what faith is. I don't even know who Jesus is. See, it wouldn't be right to do that, would it? And so he's speaking to us, those of us who are in Christ. All right. Now notice, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, if you wouldn't mind. And I think I'm just going to keep using this pulpit Bible because, man, it's easy to read. There's something about a new Bible with large print. It just makes a man happy. The just shall live by his faith. Four times the Bible tells us that. We are the just, those of us who have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And notice it's not of works. It's not of works. There's nothing that you can do to earn salvation. You cannot earn God's favor. Some people think that, well, you know, if I give big enough offerings, God's going to smile upon that. <laughs> well, he might smile upon it. Actually, the preacher's going to smile. But... Uh, 
you know, you don't, you don't get a get out of jail free card because you give big offerings. Glory to God. But in Hebrews chapter 11, let me show you something else. We're to live by faith, but now here's something that maybe you didn't know. It says in verse 6 of chapter 11 in Hebrews, but without faith it is almost impossible to please him. No, the Bible says it is absolutely impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder <clears throat> of them that diligently seek him. <clears throat> Without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God. Now, I want to go ahead and hi I've highlighted this in my old Bible in Hebrews 11. Let me just show you something else. Hebrews chapter 11 is called the great hall of faith. I'm going to do this hurriedly, so just try to follow along. Of course, Hebrews chapter 11, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is a substance. It is a substance of things that are hoped for. And then in verse 3, it tells you through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things that are seen were not made of things which do appear. Verse 4, by faith Abel did this. By, verse 5, by faith Enoch. Uh, verse 7, by faith Noah. Verse 8, by faith Abraham. Verse 9, by faith. Verse 11, through faith Sarah. Verse 17, by faith Abraham. Verse 20, by faith Isaac. 21, by faith Jacob. 22, by faith Joseph. 23, by faith Moses. 24, by faith. 27, by faith. 28, through faith. 29, by faith. Verse 30, by faith the walls fell down. Verse 31, by faith. Verse 33, through faith. My goodness gracious, are you seeing a theme? Uh-huh. The whole chapter. No wonder why it's called the Great Hall of Faith. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind, uh, <clears throat> you know, it says in verse, uh, look at verse, uh, verse 39. All, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Huh. God having provided some better thing for us, that they with, that they without us should not be made perfect. Well, by faith, it kept them going, didn't it? I mean, you may not see everything you think you're supposed to see. Things may not happen the way you thought they were going to happen. But by faith, I keep moving forward. By faith, I, ke I keep pressing on. By faith, I keep believing. By faith, I keep confessing. By faith, I keep coming to church. By faith, I keep reading my Bible. By faith, I keep preaching the truth. You may not see any difference. I mean, lives may not change. Nobody may get what you're... Nobody might see it. They may not get it. They may not see it. They may not act like you do, or they may think you've lost your mind, but by faith, you just keep going. By faith, you just keep going. Praise the Lord. Let me show you Abraham's example in Romans real quick. Uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter 4. Let me show you this. So the just, that's me, that's you, shall live by faith. Without faith, if we're not going to live by faith, it is impossible to please God. Don't even think that you're going to get him to even give you a glance if you're going to do this thing any other way except by faith, okay? He might give you a glance. He might give you a nod, but it won't be a, a nod of affirmation. Amen. You ever notice in the New Testament, Jesus upbraided them for their unbelief? Jesus chastised them? Wherefore did you doubt? Why, why are you so fearful, ye of little faith? How long do I have to put up with you? I mean, you know, after Peter got out of that boat, when Jesus said, come, and Peter began to sink, and Peter said, Lord, save me. You would think if he put one foot on the water, and it didn't sink, and then he put the other foot, and it didn't sink, you might be thinking, my God, look at me go. Instead, he looked around at the circumstances, he took his eyes off of Jesus, and he began to sink. And when Jesus pulled him up, Jesus didn't say, come here, let me give you a hug. <sighs> Jesus said, what's wrong with you, son? What's wrong with you? Nobody else in that boat even walked on water, but you did. And then you took your eyes off of me and you sank. Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> you guys all right? Look at Abraham's example. You ready? In chapter 4 in the book of Romans, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith 
that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. When? When did God make him a father of many nations? Long before he even had a kid. Excuse me, son or child have to be a little bit more politically <clears throat> aware nowadays. Somebody got mad at me because I was calling their children kids. They said, they ain't no goats. I said, man, I've been saying kids my whole life. I was called a kid my whole life. Still am. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead, calls those things which be not as though they were. Boy, there's something you ought to highlight. He calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. It was spoken, and he didn't become a father of many nations until he got his confession right. So shall thy seed be. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. What did we see by Abraham's example here? Abraham did not consider his body being dead or the deadness of his wife's body. When God said you're going to be the father of many nations, when God said you're going to have a son and by this child you're going to be blessed, you're not even going to be able to number the descendants. You're not even going to be able to number them. If you look out there and you see the stars and the grains of sand, if you can count them, well, then you'd be doing something good. But it's going to be more than that. But he, hadn't, he didn't have a son, he didn't have a child, and he couldn't at this point. And Abraham didn't say, well, I'm just, I'm just going to act like there's, there's nothing going on here. I'm going to act like I'm not old and, and, and just, just pretend. Let's just play make-believe and pretend for a while. No, Abraham did not consider the fact that he was old. He said, I'm just going to consider God's promise. I'm going to consider the faithfulness of God. I'm going to be fully persuaded. I'm not going to stagger at the promise. I'm going to be strong in faith. I'm going to give glory to God. I'm going to be fully persuaded. And that's the example that we have from Abraham. The just shall live by faith. In other words, God God's not saying the circumstances are not there. God's not saying the doctor's report is a lie. God's not saying that the tumor or the cancer or this or that isn't what's happening. God's not saying that. God's saying in spite of what's happening, I have something higher and better. I have something that is stronger than. I have something that will cancel out the report. I have something that will cause the tumor to disappear. Man, you can't hardly lose with the stuff we use. We use faith. We put all kinds of faith on it. Uh, maybe I'm the only one getting excited in here. See, faith calls those things which be not as though they were. Well, God said this. That's what I'm going to say. It's not happening right now, but I'm not going to look out there and call the circumstances like they are right now. I'm going to call it according to what the promise says. Let the weak say, I am strong. That doesn't mean that your body's not weak. It doesn't mean that you don't have any strength in your legs. It doesn't mean that. It just means that you're saying, I am strong. I am full of life. And the life of God in me is changing things. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Strong in faith. The just shall live by faith. So <clears throat> how important is faith, do you think? So when somebody says to you, doesn't your preacher preach on anything other than that? You're like, well, I don't know. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. It doesn't say the just shall live by prophecy. It doesn't say the just shall live by the book of Revelation. It, it, it doesn't say the, the just shall live by the, the nation of Israel. Now, these are all good things. These are all important things. But sometimes people get so caught up in teaching out of Revelation that they forget 
Listen, I'm living in the right now, me, now, and here. And I need faith right now. I need my faith to be strong. I, I'm interested in what's going to happen later, but I ain't that interested because it's going to happen whether I believe it or not. And I'm interested in what's happening with Israel. Of course I am. But I'm over here in the United States of America. I live in Byron. Man, I'm telling you what, this is pretty good if you'll pay attention to what I'm saying. We get so caught up in these other things that, you know, it's like, wait a minute. How about giving me stuff that I need right now? How do I keep from ripping my husband's head off? How do I keep from killing my kids? How do I keep from going out there and murdering my neighbor? I mean, how do I keep from ah, losing my mind? <laughs> Glory to God. In other words, let's bring it home. Let's bring it to where you are right now and tell you this. That you have got to live this life by faith and no other way. Yeah, but I believe, Pastor, that the church is too, we're too internal in our focus. We have to start thinking externally. No, duh! Like, who said you're not supposed to do that? Somehow or other, somebody got out there and decided that it was lucrative and, 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 a, and, and a good business venture to start changing things up a little bit. You know, well, you know, the church needs to get out of the building. Duh, you get out of the building every time you leave. Let's think about this a minute. Every time you walk out those doors, you have left the building. My God, what is wrong with people? You need to gather yourselves. So you need to come together so that you can be properly taught and trained up. You need to come together because families have to gather together. I mean, you, you got to come and worship. You got to come corporate worship. This is how we come together. And this is how you receive from your gift, your pastor. And then when you leave, guess what? We don't sleep here and camp out here. We haven't walled the, the property. We go out there. And when you go out to work or when you go to Walmart or whenever, whatever you do, wherever you go, you are taking this with you. Like who lied to us? Somebody duped us, man. Somebody sold us a bill of goods and I for one am tired of it. And so what that teaching is doing and what that mindset is doing is it's hurting the churches. And the church is, <laughs> there's no plan B. This is God's best plan. Whew, man, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting ahead of myself. <sighs> Let me read this to you from the New International. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. Just make a note of Jeremiah 29, 11. New International says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. The New Living Translation says they are plans for good and not for disaster. Does God have a plan for you? Does God have a plan for me? Does God have a plan for everybody you know? Yes. But let me tell you this, this might shock you, and I hope that you'll buckle up and listen to this. God's plan for your life does not exclude faith. Every plan that God has, every perfect plan for every man, woman, boy, and girl includes faith. God's not going to devise or develop or implement a plan that excludes faith. In other words, you're not going to get a free pass. Lord, is there any other way? God's going to say, nope. You got to do it by faith. How's my marriage going to be saved? You got to do it by faith. How are my kids going to be saved? You got to do it by faith. How am I going to succeed? You got to do it by faith. How am I going to have peace and get free from anxiety? You got to do it by faith. And unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. So in other words, if you accomplish these things any other way, it's in vain. He didn't say the house won't get built because there's a lot of, you know, the great thing about the church in America is the amazing things we can do without God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So God does not design a plan for my life or your life that does not 
include faith. Okay, so what else does his plan include? I thought you'd never ask. Philippians, if you wouldn't mind. Philippians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians 4. Glory be to God. Let me check myself against my pulpit Bible too, make sure I'm right. <laughs> Hallelujah. The plan of God will always include faith. It will always include faith. If I live by faith, then everything that I do is by faith. Everything that I will achieve or accomplish, I get up by faith. I show up to preach by faith. I go to work by faith. I do these things by faith. <clears throat> the plan of God will always include <clears throat> faith. In fact, the Bible even says we walk by faith and not by sight. So if you're walking by sight, then you're not on solid ground. So if you base your life in anything other than faith, something's wrong. So the plan of God is always going to include faith, but something else. I was reading this this past week, and this jumped out at me. It hit me like a brick in the head. And this is not even what the context is. So are you ready? It says this in verse, no, it's Philippians 4, verse number 15. Now, you Philipp, let me. I'm just going to read the whole thing and then we'll get to what I want to get to. You Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, Paul says that no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica... Ye sent once and again unto my necessity. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, I like to highlight verse 19 usually. Anybody agree with that? Of course I do. I believe that God supplies all of our need according to his riches and glory. But verse 19 is connected to the preceding verses. And in its context, Paul is talking about, Paul is talking about this church partnering with him, in essence, and giving yet once and again. Giving once and again unto my necessity. Not that I desire a gift, but I'm desiring fruit that may abound to your account. And I've always been caught in that, and I thought, well, praise the Lord. You know, you get partnered up with the things of God, or if you get partnered up with people that, you know, God brings you, God brings you together with certain people. And you can partner with them, and you can give. You can give into their ministry. You can give into their work. Not just once, but you can do it continually and partner with them. And then you will receive. It says giving and receiving. But here's what jumped off the page at me. It has nothing to do with what I just said. I was reading this this week. Now, you, verse 15, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you. No church. That's what jumped off at. The, right at, it hit me. Wait a minute. He's not talking about the universal church. He's talking about individual churches. If we're, not, if we're supposed to do away with the individual churches, and if we're supposed to be focused on the universal church, and we're not supposed to have these individual churches, then I guess Jesus didn't know it, and Paul didn't know it, because it's still in the Bible. No church. He's talking about individual churches. No church did this except your church. Your church did this. You guys did this. Oh, well, pastor, the church is the people. We're, no, duh. No, duh. I think we get carried away. We, we get so educated and so progressive that we get so dumb. I know that we are the church, but we're talking about individual church fellowships or assemblies is what we're talking about. In the book of Revelation, he said, under the angel of the church of, and there were seven of them he named, individual churches. 
Don't get to the place where you get duped. That way, you know, it's not important where you go to church. That's a lie. That's a lie. It matters everything where you go. It matters everything what you partner with and who you partner with. This church supports Mark Hankins Ministries. It helps to anyway. Praise the Lord. Aren't there other ones? Of course there are. But we, I make sure that a regular check goes out to Pastor Mark Hankins. Why? Because I believe that that's how we're going to honor and esteem and partner with him. And I always receive. Always. I receive. He's primarily my biggest source right now. I mean, Buzzy Sutherland don't live here no more. So he gone. Mother Jenkins, she don't live here no more. So she gone. Kenneth E. Hagan, he don't live here no more. He gone. But Mark Hankins is still here. Glory to God. The point I'm making is that not only, do, not only does the plan of God require faith, but it requires a local church assembly, a faith family. The plan of God will always include the right church. Always. And if you can't say amen, at least say oh me, or say something. What else would the plan of God include for your life. Oh, I thought you'd never ask. How about Ephesians chapter 4? You're going to like this one too. Now pay attention. We're, we're going to be done here shortly. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up, Jesus, when Jesus ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave programs unto men. Oh, oh excuse me, hold on. He led captivity captive, and he gave philosophies unto men. He gave franchises unto men. He gave skinny jeans and muscle shirts. No, he gave gifts unto men. And in verse number 11, he tells you what these gifts are. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ, not the tearing down of the body of Christ. Just because someone wants to jump into a church position does not mean that they are a ministry gift given by Jesus, the head of the church. It's the head of the church who gives these gifts. You can't just give yourself and call yourself a gift. Some of these people crack you up because they have the look, man. Listen, I can't tell you how many things I've had to resist in this church. People that say they've been sent from God and I have a gift and I have a talent. And now Jesus is sending me to your church to do this or that. Oh, really? When can I serve and begin my ministry? Well, you just sit there and shut up for a while. I'll let you know when. You know where they're all at? They gone. He gave gifts. He did give gifts. Some of these things, we just decided it was a good idea because after all, we got to be culturally relevant. Well, if you're pursuing cultural relevance, you might as well try to grasp the wind because it shifts and it moves so quickly. What's relevant now won't be relevant tomorrow. And what I'm saying is that Jesus gave us gifts. He gave some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to do, uh, to, to perfect the saints so that they could do the work of the ministry. And you have to be very careful that some clever cat didn't just show up and say, hey, I got a program that'll work. I've had people tell me, you need this program, it'll grow your church. You need that pro. I mean, I have been given names. They, were spe they had specific names. If you, if you apply this program to your church in Byron, I guarantee results. Well, what about the Holy Ghost program? Yeah. What about the program of obeying the Holy Spirit? What about the program of listening to the Spirit of God? What about the program of the pastor getting into the pulpit and doing a disappearing act? Because I'm nothing. If all you see is me, I am failing. You need faith, you need a local church assembly, and 
the plan of God will always include the ministry gifts. And you might be one. But we can help activate that and train you up, can't we? Of course we can. What's the last thing that the plan of God will include? Well, I thought you'd never ask. Romans 13. What am I saying to you? I'm saying this to you. The plan of God is perfect. It's the, it is the best thing for my life. But I can't just do whatever I want and say, I'm going to have God's best and I'm going to live however I want, do whatever I want, and I'm going to have God's best. Look at me. Look at me go. Look at me go through life. I'm doing whatever I want. I'm going to see whatever I want. I'm going to talk the way I want. I'm going to act the way I want. And I'm going to have God's best. Oh, oh. And if for some reason my prayer doesn't get answered and things go awry, then I'm going to do this. How dare you do that to me? He, he didn't. He didn't. There's a little something about sin you need to know. You want to know something about sin? I thought you probably should hear this. When God encourages you or even commands you not to do certain things, it's not because of the reason that you think that he's a killjoy and an ogre and see, God doesn't want me having any fun. No, sin is not bothering God like it's going to bother you. What sin will do is it will harden your heart. It will cause your conscience to become seared. Sin will keep you from following God's best plan because it takes you down an alternate route. Because you can't go down God's best plan and keep sinning at the same time. And so you have to form this hardness and you have to tell yourself, I'm okay, we're okay, grace has it covered. See, now God didn't smoke me, I can keep doing this. Or, or how about this? How about this? The human mind is never more resourceful and clever than when it justifies your actions. And see, that causes your heart to become hard. So when God says, don't do this and don't do that, or when he encourages you down another road, he's telling you, be careful because your heart becomes hard. And you become deceived. And then you're so far gone, nobody can pull you back. Hmm. I just thought I'd throw that out there for you. So the plan of God will require faith. The plan of God will require a local church fellowship, right? The plan of God will require ministry gifts and Romans 13. You guys okay? Here we go. You ready? Romans 13, verse number 8. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. Verse 10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. It's the fulfilling of the law. So above all of these things, guess what there is? Love. And when everything else fails, when everything else ceases, and when things are done away with, guess what remains? Love. Love. Love never fails. It's the fulfilling of the law. And so if you forget everything that I've said, and you can't really figure out, and maybe there's some things you should forget that I said today. <laughs> but if you can't remember anything else, remember this. The plan of God will always include love always and that is your safe default now what should I do here I, I can't remember what the scripture oh I know what I'll do I'll act in love see how that will fix everything acting in love if I'm acting in love toward my wife I'm not watching pornography now, don't act, don't don't get all goofy with that okay I, that's your business whatever you do but if I'm acting in love toward my family then I'm going to do things a certain way, and then I'm not going to do things a certain way. If I'm acting in love toward my church, then I'm going to do things a certain way, and I'm not going to do things a certain way. I think one thing I should say here is this. Every one of you carries a supply of the Spirit. Every one of you has a supply of the Spirit. God has invested something in you, and... 
when we come together, you bring your supply. You bring your supply. I need your supply. Your brothers and sisters need your supply. And you need their supply. And you need my supply. And when we withhold that from one another, is that love? Well, no, it's not. Because love worketh no ill to its neighbor. And I understand that we're dealing with weak flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But when it comes time to praise and worship the Lord, if you'll focus on God, that will do so much for you. And you can say, you know, and maybe this music is a little bit loud or it's not really my style. But after all, it's about you, Lord. So, Father, it's the least I could do is say, Lord, I, I just I love you and I thank you for loving me. And I thank you for everything that I have. And what it'll do is it'll start preparing you to receive the word. It'll start preparing you to give what you have in you. But when you come to church and you make up your mind, I don't know what kind of church this is. I don't know what kind of music this is. And that pastor, I don't know who he thinks he is. Guess what you've just done? You've just shut your spirit. You've just shut things down. You're not giving anything worth giving out, and you're not receiving anything worth receiving. You've just shut it all out and shut it all down. And so God gives us opportunities to just clear ourselves and to say, okay, let me get ready for this experience. Because the way you do it here is the way you will do it out there. The way you worship here is the way you'll worship there.